So I've started my second year of therapy school and I have noticed that all, there are a few things missing in the way that therapy is taught and talked about. Uh, and one of the things that I've noticed is a curious absence of love. Let me explain. Um, it's not that therapy and therapists are unloving. Um, it's that they don't talk about it. In a way, it underpins and is implied by a lot of what the field does and tries to do. And yet, we don't talk about it. All the theories that I've read, or, or all the theories I've studied, all the books that I've read on therapy so far, not one of them really addresses love directly. What they do do is they talk around love and they talk about family dynamics. They talk about romantic relationships. They talk about marriage. They talk about friendship. They talk about self-esteem. They talk about all these things that imply love, but never do they actually address it directly. And I think that's strange. I think that's strange for several reasons, particularly because in my own journey, in my own healing journey, my own uh, spiritual journey, love has been the thing that has made the greatest difference in my life. It has made the greatest difference in my own ability to heal and forgive myself, as well as to be able to connect with other people and connect also with genuinely life-giving spiritual experiences. Love is as mythology likes to talk about it, it is the strongest magic. It is the thing that lifts the curse. It is the thing that brings the dead back to life. And not just in the Jesus story, it is also in many fairy tales and folk tales. Um, true love's kiss is something that is we know from our movies, our books, our stories from hundreds of years ago is something so potent and powerful. Why? does our major uh, healing tradition, psychotherapy, not talk about it and not utilize it more explicitly? I have some theories about that. So why is love missing from the discussion? I think that for the most part, um, one of the reasons is that psychotherapy is a primarily cognitive um, discipline. It, the overall strategy that therapy has used over the course of its 100-year run or so has been to try and address um, cognitively with mental processes things that are emotional, intuitive, subconscious, uh, and physiological or, you know, interpersonal as well. Um, it uses the mind to address things that have nothing to do with the mind. And... Uh, or, re or rather, at least the cognitive rational mind. And so it's something that, you know, I've noticed is that when you are so focused up here in the intellect, in the cognitive and the rational, you are cut off at the head, you're cut off at the neck. And a lot of people, a lot of uh, Western, you know, I think kind of uh, uh, scientific, philosophical white men, um, a lot of Western thought has been cut off at the neck. It has been out of touch with the body, and it has been out of touch with the heart. And the heart, I'm talking about it, you know, metaphorically as like the place of love, um, but also as the, the neurological uh, center of the heart where we actually can feel, um, you know, well, scientifically now, neurologically, we know there are a lot of neurons around the heart area, and they actually help in processing our cognition, help in processing our understanding and relationships with the world. There's also a lot in the gut, probably even more so than the heart, but that's another video. But focusing on the intellect, we are actually cut off from uh, really being able to access this warm, gooey, loving feeling, whether towards ourselves or to other people. Um, and furthermore, this is in psychotherapy in recent decades, it's been, we've kind of doubled down on it because psychotherapy as a whole has been uh, insecure about its own status as a soft science. 
Uh, it wants to and has been trying to establish itself as a serious scientific discipline by trying to create these studies uh, that use data-driven, mathematics-driven uh, kind of, uh, you know, experiments. And love is just not very scientific. It doesn't have that. It, it, it looks bad. It looks bad. What are you talking about love? How do you measure that? How do you how do you calculate you know how much love someone has for somebody else? How how do you make that fit that into a scientific framework? It's very difficult to do. It's not impossible to do. You can probably create some kind of metric for it, but it's it's hard to do. And it, by definition, it, love is something that uh, it escapes that. It escapes words. It escapes uh, you know communication. It it makes us do seemingly irrational things, but when coming from that place, it has the power to just break all boundaries and do, um, you know, what rationally doesn't make sense, but from, you know, a spiritual and uh, divine place, it makes perfect sense. It's even hard, I did a poor job of explaining that, but that's that's kind of the point. It's hard to talk about. Um, so, psychology as a field, therapy as a practice, for the most part, comes from the head. And it has little experience really dropping into the heart and communicating and connecting with others from that heart-centered place. Um, there's also something else that I think makes therapists afraid of talking about love in this direct way that spirituality and a lot of, you know, mystics and religious traditions are much more open and ready to do. And it's the fact that uh, when the field of psychotherapy was coming into fruition, uh, this was the time of, you know, Sigmund Freud. He was focused on sex, not love. He was focused primarily on sexuality. And there's a reason for this. Around that time, Darwinian evolution, that whole theory was hot off the press. This was the way, this was, you know, the, the kind of emerging dominant narrative that uh, we were seeing that, oh, everything that biological beings do is for the sake of survival. Boom, that's the bottom line. And so love... Forget about that. That that's that makes us do crazy, irrational things. If anything, that is a strange byproduct of the sexual, uh, you know, mechanical drive to reproduce and to survive and perpetuate the species. Um, and so, love didn't really figure much into uh, you know Freud's initial thinking, and, and honestly, much of you know uh, the rest of uh, psychology, behaviorism, and you know now cognitive behavioral uh, psychology uh, has kind of followed that trend. Now, there have been people that you know have pushed back on this, and in fact, many of Freud's uh, disciples, uh, like Carl Jung, like Adler, uh, and I believe even, even his um, uh, other people too, they push back on this and say, hey, Freud, not so fast. Uh, there's more to, to love and connection than, than your, you know, meets the eye. And so therapy, I don't want to pigeonhole it. It is a, a vast, you know, and kind of uh, complicated uh, practice that we've developed. But the roots of it have this, you know, this focus on sex, not on love. And I think what has happened is that a lot of therapists are afraid that if they talk about love, if they talk about love and they feel and express love to their clients, the people they're working with, they are worried that it risks breaching the boundary into sex into sexuality. And one of the biggest taboos in therapy is sexing your clients. That is a big no-no. We get told that over and over and over and over again um, not to do it. Ironically, as uh, my wife has showed me, uh, if you actually look at the uh, list of things that therapists have been reprimanded for, at least in the state of Louisiana, um, the vast majority of them have been reprimanded for exactly that, having sex with their clients. So despite the fact that we put so much emphasis on not doing that, we end up doing it anyway. 
Why? Well, maybe that's because that's how taboos work. The more that you repress something and say not to do it, the more power you actually give it. You know, as therapists, as psychologists, you'd think that we would know this by now. This is, this is fundamental psychological dynamics. But no, we <laughs> repress it. We say, don't talk, don't do this thing. Don't love your clients because you might end up sexing your clients. And we don't want that. Uh, except we end up doing it anyway because shadow. Um, so what I propose and what I think the field of psychotherapy uh, could really benefit from is looking over and taking a page from spirituality, taking a page from the traditions that really take love seriously and are willing to talk about it directly and openly and honestly. And I think that if we do that, what we can bring into the practice is a much more holistic and, well, for lack of better words, heart-centered way of healing. And it's not just pretty words. It will actually make the practice of healing that we're doing more effective. One of the biggest factors for therapeutic change they told us on day one is the relationship that you have with the person that you're working with. And they call it rapport, developing a rapport, a, a therapeutic relationship. But there is no faster and deeper and more effective way that I know of to create a strong and affirming and healing relationship with another human being than through genuine heart open love. And so what I hope to be able to um, bring into the practice, not only my own, but also to, to talk about it on, you know, on whatever opportunities I'll be able to have, is to bring this notion that love, the heart, is not only something that is you know, beautiful to talk about, it is also something that is incredibly healing, incredibly effective at transforming people's lives. Not only is learning how to love ourselves something that is transformative for, for our negative self-talk and our you know, self-criticism and all of uh, the kind of neurotic um, you know, noise that we have in our, in our heads and in our, in our emotional nervous system, but also being able to fully love and give love freely to others without expectation of return, that is what makes, that's what makes life live, worth living. And that's what I think makes a society um, a place that we want to live. I think that, you know, this is not just about learning how to be healthy. Uh, mentally so that we can show up for work and do our jobs. This is about how do we live as a species? How do we live as a civilization? How do we live in a community and communion with one another and also with nature in a way that feeds us and in this cyclical, reciprocal way? Because honestly, if we think that life is just about survival, if we buy into that uh, story and that narrative, whew, it is a dark and bleak universe. But if, on the other hand, we look to the mystics and the spiritual traditions and we believe what they say, that love itself is the very fabric of this universe, that consciousness has, is somehow deeply entwined and integrated with the capacity and experience of love, then that is a much easier world to live in. And I think it would lead to a much, much friendlier, much warmer, much healthier uh, civilization. And that's one that I want to live in. If you'd like to experience the power of spiritual psychology yourself, go down to the description and sign up for a one-on-one -on -one coaching consult with me. After booking a call, you'll automatically be considered for possible scholarship funding and get access to my newsletter, as well as receive a free 
eight minute guided exercise to help tap into your true self. If you want more, down in the description, you'll also find a link to join my community circle where we gather on Zoom every week to share nourishing conversation about spirituality and psychology. Or follow the links in the description to join the Stable Awakening Discord for a thought-provoking discussion and a monthly reading group where we read Alan Watts, Carl Jung, and other spiritual classics. Thank you for joining me, and I hope to connect with you soon.